Um, as a reminder, we're going to be continuing our series concerning the fruit of the Spirit. And I'll take this into consideration for next time. Uh, the screen cuts off, so um, if you have your Bible, uh, you can open it up and read these verses also. But these are the verses which our study surrounds. Galatians 5, 22, 23, where we read about the nine fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. And so tonight, the last few sermons I did was an introduction to the fruit of the Spirit, how that the Word of God is the seed which is planted in our heart. And when we obey that Word, these are the fruits which will be produced. And so in reference to the Spirit here, it's the Holy Spirit, as found in Matthew 28, 19. This, because when we read about in Scripture, there's a few different ways that you can interpret spirit. Either refers to man's spirit, God's Holy Spirit, our um, attitude. Here, it's found the fruit of the Spirit, and this is reference to um, God, the Holy Spirit. And we find that Matthew 28, 19, where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three different individuals, but they share, they're equal in the same nature. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And this will help us in tonight's study because we're going to see that the Holy Spirit has the knowledge to reveal to us what the Father and what the Son want us to know. Because just as the Father and the Son are divine, know all things, the Scripture teaches that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, searches the mind of God, searches the deep things. So the Spirit is able to reveal to us everything which God wants us to know. Just as we have human nature, you have a husband, a wife, and a child, and God, or the Scriptures say that, they are called human. A husband is called human. The wife is called human. The child is called human. Same thing, reference to the God nature. You have the father. The scripture says he's invisible. So the invisible God, so I didn't put an image up there. Um, you have the son who is the image of the invisible God. And you have the Holy Spirit. Although this is in, uh, I believe, Matthew 3 at the baptism of John, where it says he's seen the spirit descending upon Jesus as a dove. This is not saying that the spirit is a dove, but this is one image which the scriptures give to us. But in the same way, how there's three different individuals all partaking of the same nature, same thing with God. The Father's called God, the Son is called God, and so is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit revealed to us these teachings which we're going to review tonight. These scriptures, which we have found in these 27 books of the New Testament, um, are things which God wants to be taught to every single nation. And so I have the dot, dot, dot here because uh, I removed some words from these verses for the purpose of explaining this. And what this is talking about is the mystery, which is something which has been hidden since the beginning of creation. Um, now that the Holy Spirit was given by Jesus to the apostles, the time period came that those things which had been kept secret since the beginning of the world would be revealed. And we have those things written down for us. The revelation, meaning the revealing of the mystery kept secret since the world began, now made manifest, made known to all nations for obedience to the faith. What is the purpose of the 27 books of the New Testament? Uh, the New Testament. We, some of them are letters. We reference them as books. Um, but 27 in the New Testament, it says, manifest, made known to all nations, not just Jew, not just Gentile, but Jew and Gentile, every nation, every language, for the obedience to the faith. These things instruct us to become obedient. And when we're obedient, we have those fruit of the spirit. As Jesus said, whoever keeps his word produces that fruit. In the New Testament, there's six words found for love. I, I put them up here. I'm not uh, professional in pronouncing these. You have uh, agape, O, oh, found 142 times. Agape, found 116. Phileo, 25. Philadelphia, 6. Philanthropia, 2. Uh, Philaguera, one time. 
And so we see, though, the definition of each of these words, um, to love dearly, full, complete, and mature love, to have a personal attachment to, brotherly love between Christians, love toward mankind, and the one instance, the love of money. And so in Galatians 5, when it's revealed, the fruit of the Spirit, um, the one which every Christian shares in um, as they obey God's word, the word chosen to be used is agape. This is the Strong's number. So if you say you're reading uh, uh, an electronic um, Bible application, it'll show you the definition for the Greek word. It's G26 and Strong's. But this is the definition, full, complete, and mature love. And it's found 116 times in the New Testament. And the four different primary ways we read how this word is used is the father's love toward mankind, where it says the father loved us. The son's love for mankind, how Jesus loved us and gave himself as a sacrifice for us. Mankind's love for God and also mankind's love for mankind. So through this lesson, we're going to review this word used primarily in these four ways. The father's love for us, the son's love for us, mankind's love for us, or rather mankind's love for God and mankind's love for mankind. And as stated before, the word love is found in a lot of different verses in the New Testament, but the verses which we're going to look at is where agape is used not the other words for love. Um, so the question is, how do we bear agape fruit? Jesus spoke in Luke eight fifteen. but the ones that fell on the good ground are those who having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. How do we bear this fruit? Agape. We hear about agape, which is what we're doing tonight. This seed is being planted on your heart right now. We're hearing about this love, this full, complete and mature love. And when we keep, meaning obey the teachings about agape, we're going to bear the agape fruit, meaning the fruit of love. Um, so we're going to hear about those things tonight. The seed's going to be planted. And so it's up to us whether we're going to obey these things which we hear um, or whether we disregard them. If we obey them, we're going to have that fruit of the spirit. And the first uh, example Concerning that list, uh, the four ways primarily love is used in the New Testament is the father has this love toward us. Um, first John chapter four, verse nine. And this, the love, the agape of God was manifested toward us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Uh, the scriptures teach that God loves us. This is one example of how God loves us because he sent his son into the world. And there's religions out there who claim to believe in God, um, but any religion which denies that God sent his son into the world, what are they doing? They're actually denying the love which God had manifested to us. Manifest means revealed. God revealed his love for us in sending his son. But anyone who says God did not send his son, they're denying the love which God has for us. One example is Muslim. The Muslim religion claims that God has no son. Um, they believe God has prophets, but no son. So therefore, what is the Muslim doing according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, when they say God did not send his son into the world? He does not have a son. They're denying the love which has already been revealed for us. We can't change this. Either we can accept it or we can reject it. And this goes for those two who say there is no God. If they say there is no God, guess what they're saying? There is no son of God. And so by doing so, what are they doing? According to first John chapter four, verse nine, they are denying the love which God has already manifested. So if we want this love, this agape in our lives, what do we do? According to first John chapter four, verse nine, we believe this. We accept this. We believe God sent his son into the world that through him we might live. By denying God's love for us, what are we actually doing? We're denying God. Jude chapter one, verse four tells us the result of those who deny God. This is reference to false teachers um, creeping in. But it says certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. So here there's condemnation involved for who 
ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God, reference to the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't embrace this love, which God has already manifested for us, and we deny that love, say those things aren't true. We are denying God and his son. And this is the end result, condemnation. Uh, Romans 8 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but walk according to the spirit. And that's what we're doing. We're studying these things, believing them so that we can walk according to the spirit. Not only does the father have this love, this agape for us, but so does his son. In John chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus speaking, Jesus said, greater love, greater agape has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. And this is what Paul wrote, Jesus did for us. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And so here, this says, greater love has no one than this to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus, it says, uh, laid down his life for the ungodly. How great of a love is that? This individual would die for their friends, but Jesus died for the ungodly. In Ephesians, it says that uh, before converted, we're enemies, alienated from God because of our mind, because of our wicked works. And Jesus, his love was so great, he died for us. And so there is no greater love than this uh, that we have written down for us. And although it's so simple, uh, Jesus died to save us. There's no greater love ever thought of. And mankind could be on earth for a hundred thousand more years and have all that time to think of all these great stories of this great and marvelous love and nothing will ever top the love that Jesus revealed by dying for us. Jesus didn't come to earth and die to save us in a story. Jesus came to earth to die for us, to save us in real life. This is what Titus 2, 14, it's a reality for us when we accept these teachings and we produce the fruit from obeying God's word. Jesus himself, uh, he gave himself for us. That's reference to him dying for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. That's talking about the church. When an individual believes that Jesus died for them, they repent, uh, they're forgiven, they're redeemed from every lawless deed they have committed. They're purified through these teachings that we obey. And we're a member of the church and we should be zealous for good works. And so just as uh, we read about denying the father's love by saying the father doesn't have a son uh, who was sent into the world, who denies the son's love? Those who say that the son did not die. I use the example about Muslims. I'll use that again because Muslims believe that Jesus was a prophet of God, but they say Jesus did not die. The Muslims actually believe that Jesus ascended into heaven without dying. But what does the scriptures teach? The scriptures teach Jesus died for us and he loved us. And so he died for us. And so what are those people saying who say that Jesus did not die? They're denying the love which Christ has for us. And also, those who say the Son of God did not die for us, what are they doing? They're denying the love which Christ showed for us. This would be an example. The Jews in the first century knew Jesus died. They're the ones who crucified him. So just admitting that Jesus died is not enough. We have to believe Jesus died for us, as it says, gave himself for us. Why? What happens when we actually believe that Jesus died for us? We're redeemed. It makes us turn away from those lawless deeds that we might be purified and become zealous for good works. How do we know what good works are? According to the New Testament, which was written down uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. By doing these things, uh, we have the fruit of the spirit. And so this love is being planted on our hearts as we're going through this. Jesus loved himself or he loved us, gave himself for us. So that seed is now planted on your heart. What is that going to do? 
If we keep that in mind and continue to learn about God's love, that will produce agape within ourselves, within our own lives. And so how do we know these things? How do we know that the father revealed or I'm sorry. How do we know the father loves us? Agapes us. How do we know that the son agapes us? The Holy Spirit. We know these things because the Holy Spirit has revealed them to us. The Holy Spirit revealed to us that God loves us. The Father loves us. The Holy Spirit revealed that the Son loves us. And that's exactly what Romans chapter 5 verses 5 through 8 teach that the Holy Spirit revealed the love of God. Without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't know the love of God. Jesus could have died. And if these things weren't taught and written down for us, we wouldn't know them. It says this. The love, the agape of God has been poured out in our hearts. How? How do we know about the love of God? How was it poured out in our hearts? By the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That's them in the first century. The Holy Spirit was given to them beginning on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit revealed these things to those who the Holy Spirit was given to. And they wrote these things down for us. And this is what the Holy Spirit revealed about the love of God. This is the love of God. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely, meaning barely, for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love, his agape toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is how the Holy Spirit reveals the love of God. By telling us that God loves us. And notice here, uh, the Holy Spirit is our instructor. And that's exactly what 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 teaches. The Holy Spirit is our instructor. And we can fill in the blank here. We're going to look at this. It's dot, 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 because I don't have the whole verse up here. But no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. And what did they reveal on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given? Who did they say was Lord? Jesus. If the Holy Spirit was not given, uh, it would not have been revealed that Jesus is the Lord. It says no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Can we not replace this, which is underlined with any New Testament teaching? No one can say there is one church except by the Holy Spirit. Who revealed that there's one church? The Holy Spirit. Um, and so we can do that with any New Testament teaching that we find. The Holy Spirit revealed it for us. And so because of the Father's love for us, we can be forgiven through Christ's death and his resurrection. We just read the Father loves us, demonstrated it by sending his son to die for us. Jesus likewise loves us with that same love. The Father agapes us. The son agapes us. They love us with that same love. And here's the result of that love. What happened because the father loved us? What happened because the son loved us? But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, his great agape with which he loved us. And notice, look, these are two different Greek words. That's why I don't have agape here. Because this is a different instance. We read the six different times where the word love is used. So agape is used here, but not here. But this is the thing. God had this great agape with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. If the love of God had not been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit, we would not know about this forgiveness, which is available for us. And so. Uh, this agape, this love is experienced by us when we are made alive together with Christ. Colossians 2.12 and 13 teach when an individual dead in their sins becomes alive with Christ to experience that great agape of God. Buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. 
and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, just saying they're Gentiles, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. If you compare this with Ephesians, uh, the previous passage we just read, notice they were dead in their sins. They were made alive. In Ephesians, it says when they were dead in sins and made alive, it said, by grace, you are saved. What does that mean? You were dead in your sins. You're made alive, having forgiven you all trespasses. When you're forgiven all trespasses, guess what? By grace, you're saved. That is the great agape of God, which was revealed for us, that Jesus died for us, that we can be forgiven for every sin. And this takes place at the point of being baptized, obeying that command. And so after we're baptized, we read first John uh, chapter one tells the uh, I believe it's um, 1 John chapter 2. He says, I write to you because your sins are forgiven. They were already baptized. They were already saved. That letter was written to individuals whose sins had already been forgiven. And to the baptized believer, 1 John chapter 1 tells them after they've been baptized, when they sin, what do they do? Do they get baptized again? No, they confess their sins. Um, they confess their faults and they receive their forgiveness. So although... We are dead in our sins and we're baptized, made alive together with Christ. And we experience that great agape of God in Acts chapter eight. What did the eunuch do when he got baptized? Went on his way rejoicing. What about in Acts chapter 16 about uh, the Philippian jailer when him and his household believed and were baptized? They had great rejoicing. Why? They experienced the great agape of God. But being baptized uh, at that point, you experience the great agape of God because you experience forgiveness of your sins. But to the saint, the Christian, who is, as First John chapter 1 says, confessing their sins daily, what are they doing? They're daily experiencing the great agape, the great love of God, having their sins forgiven and cleansed. And so in the denominational world, in the churches, uh, which teach you do not have to be baptized to be saved. If you go to have a uh, listen to their Bible studies, they're teaching about the love God has for individuals. They're teaching about the love, which Jesus has for individuals. But what are they denying? They're denying that you experience the great agape of God when you're dead in your sins and made alive together with Christ. They say, God does not forgive you at your baptism. Yet they're teaching this great love God has for us. This great love the son has for us, but they don't experience this love because they deny the point at which this great agape, which God has for us, is experienced. And so they don't truly experience this great agape as an individual who becomes a member of the church of Christ does. We hear the gospel. We believe it. We're baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. And we experience that great agape. We continue living our lives in obedience to God, confessing our sins, continuously experiencing this great agape. And it's through this same love, the same agape, uh, that we have confidence for the day of judgment. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 and 18, notice again, there's some dots here because I removed some things just for the purpose of this lesson here. But it's through this love, through this fruit of the spirit, which is able to remove our fear for the day of judgment so that we can be confident and be bold. And um, during uh, Carlos's study on Acts this morning, how it said Peter and John had boldness, before the council which they stood, I looked it up. This is the same word that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. And it's through this agape, through this love, which we are able to overcome our fear for the day of judgment, that we can be confident that we'll stand before God forgiven of our sins. And it says here, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. This is not to say that we should not be afraid of God. The scriptures tell us to fear no man, but to fear God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And so... This verse is not saying don't be afraid, don't fear God, 
But what this verse is teaching is that through the love of God and knowing that he has forgiven us for every sin, we don't have to fear. We don't have to be tormented by thinking about that day of judgment, which lies ahead of us. It's through this love, which we're able to overcome uh, that fear. The New Testament also teaches about our love, which we should have toward other Christians. In John chapter 13, verse 35, this is Jesus speaking. And he says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, who is he speaking to? His disciples. If they have love for who? One another. Other disciples. Um, We're going to look at another passage in a little bit, which talks about loving our neighbor. But here's a reference to loving believers. First Peter chapter two, verse 17, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Reference to the king uh, would have been the Roman king. At that time, they had different kings throughout the lands. There was also an emperor. But here. Oh, and we notice here's another verse uh, because we just read about perfect love casts out fear. But then here it says fear God. And so that's just an example that the previous verse was talking about fear of the day of judgment, but we should still fear God. But notice we should love the brotherhood. And so what does this look like in today's generation? Uh, You have all these young men. I mean, you walk around and individuals want to be a gangster. You look at gangs. What type of love does a gang offer to an individual? If you want to be part of their gang, they it's called they jump you in. They beat you up. uh, They bruise you. They make you bleed. And then once you're in the gang, they encourage you to disobey not only God's law, but uh, the, the government. And doing illegal things for the purpose of gaining money. And so is that the love which Jesus says we should love one another with? If we look out into the world, that's the love which the world is teaching. But what about the love of God? What about the love Jesus revealed for us that we should love one another with? If we look at the life of Jesus and how he loved his disciples, he he corrected them, um, sometimes humbly, other times harshly. But the idea was behind that uh, correction, his motivation was love. He corrected them. And when they repented, immediate forgiveness is given uh, to Zacchaeus. He repented and Jesus said, this day salvation has come to this household. And so immediate forgiveness Spiritual encouragement to continue learning about God. This is how we love the brethren. Uh, We encourage each other to continue learning about God and his word. And when we see a brother who is in error, needing correction, we humbly correct them. As Galatians 6 says, uh, considering ourselves also that we're not tempted and fall into sin when we try to correct someone else. But when an individual repents, we're required to give them immediate forgiveness. Jesus said uh, to forgive 70 times seven in one day, which is 490 times. So this is the pattern for love for which we should love one another. Is this possible? It is possible. The Ephesians, which is a congregation, which was in Ephesus, they had this love. So did the Colossians. That's two different churches in two separate locations who shared the same common love. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, there's what it said in first Peter, love the brotherhood. What did they do? They loved all the saints. That included more than just who were in their area. They loved all the saints everywhere who were in every nation on the face of the planet. Colossians chapter one, verse three and four, the same thing. The Colossians loved all the saints. Uh, We give thanks to God and the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. Why did the Ephesians love all the saints and why did the Colossians love all the saints? Because the same Holy Spirit is teaching every Christian everywhere the same thing. Us today, we should have love for all the saints. And at the very least, um, what we can do in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18, it tells us, 
praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. That should be a topic which is included in our prayers. How do we show our love for all the saints, even if we don't know them? There's Christians out in the world who we never even uh, have heard of and will never know them by name. But what should we be doing for them? According to Ephesians 6, 18, we should have uh, supplication on their behalf. We should make prayers and requests on their behalf. Uh, scriptures are loaded with examples of this, praying for knowledge, for perfection, and um, for maturity in God's word. And also, we learned about loving the brotherhood. Now it comes time to learning to love our neighbor. Um, Jesus gave the example, anyone's your neighbor, and unbelievers your neighbor. Love does no evil to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And so... The other verses recompense to no man evil for evil. That's found here. Love does no evil. So if you love someone, if they do evil to you, you're not going to do evil back. First Thessalonians 515 says the same thing. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. And so the, the thing about this, though, is this says to recompense me. No one evil for evil. Does that mean if someone goes into a store with a gun and is planning on mass murdering, starts shooting people, that a person who has a gun cannot lawfully shoot that person? Is that repaying evil with evil? No, the the Bible tells us in Romans chapter uh, 13, it tells us that the government bears the sword to execute vengeance on those who do evil. Is the government going to punish a person who stopped a mass murderer? No, that's not evil. What this is talking about is harboring vengeance in your heart. Man, I can't wait for the next time that I see them so I can pay them back. That's what the idea of this is. And so this, though, ha- harboring those thoughts in your heart um, is not love. Love does no evil to a neighbor. Uh, love does good to your neighbor. Love builds up and edifies. No outside factor can separate us from the love of God and from the love of Christ. And this is a nice verse because we have here the agape of Christ and also we have the agape of God showing that God the Father and the Son both love us with that same love and nothing can separate us from that love, um, which is an outside factor. And we'll look at that next. But it says, shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril or sword I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No outside factor can separate us from God's love for us. In John chapter 10, verse 28 through 30, uh, saying the same thing, Jesus says, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And then he says, no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are alone. One, they're equal in nature. They love us with the same love. There's no outside factor which can snatch them out of their hand, um, separate them from the love of Christ. But we can separate ourselves Uh, There's no one else who can take your salvation from you except for you. You could lose it. Uh, But the idea is um, Revelation 2, 4, 5, when we correct ourselves, when we fall away from that point, we can still be forgiven. We can still be saved. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love, your first agape. They were converted. They became Christians. They were baptized. They were zealous. They wanted to learn about God's word and do those things which God's word says to do. He says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lamp stamp from his place unless you repent. Here's the idea of congregational judgment because these individuals left their first agape. They left their first love. Uh, Notice it wasn't any outside source which separated them from this love. They were taught how to love. It said they had this love. They had this first agape, but they lost it. Uh, They weren't doing the first works, but Jesus gives hope of, of restoration by promise. And he says, if you repent... If you do the first works, if you remember from where you have fallen, 
I won't remove the lampstand from its place. He says, you're going to continue um, where you are studying God's word, being that light. How? How do we abide in the agape of the father and his son is revealed by the Holy Spirit? Um, we read that agape love is a fruit of the spirit. And so how do we have that love? How do we abide in that love? Just as we started off our lesson saying uh, Jesus said that if we hear the word and keep it, we'll bear that fruit. That's exactly what this says. When we keep those commandments, we're going to have the love of God. We're going to abide in the love of God. We're going to show this love, this agape to one another and also to our neighbor reference to unbelievers. If you keep my commandments, Jesus said, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. First John 5, 3. And this is the love, the agape of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. That's how we abide in the love of God. The last uh, two verses here is, well, one after this. But now by this, we know that we know him. Here's that boldness. Here's that confidence, which it says, which even we have for the day of judgment. We know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, remember, that's what Jesus said. You keep his word. You're going to produce that fruit. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. And what do we know when the love of God is perfected in us? We're going to have boldness in the day of judgment. That's what first John chapter four said. Same book, different chapter. By this, we know that we are in him. And the last one, this is love. This is agape, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. What is agape? We learned about it tonight. The father loves us. The son loves us with this love. We should love our brethren, all the saints, those who we know and don't know with this love. And we should even love unbelievers with this love. And how do we get that love? When we walk according to his commandments, when we keep that word, this fruit will be produced in our lives. Um, and it all begins with the hearing of God's word and our obedience to it. And so this is just an encouragement for us to continue uh, reading your Bibles. When you go home, study with your families, read with your uh, children, those around you um, and continue learning about God's word so we can walk according to his commandments. If we don't know his commandments, can we walk according to them? No. So it's important that we know his commandments, that we walk according to them so that we know, as the scriptures say, we know that we know him and we can have boldness in the day of judgment. Uh, Jesus died to uh, give us forgiveness for our sins. So on that day of judgment, we can have boldness. His blood was shed, as Clark spoke earlier. Um, his body was sacrificed for our sins. And when we have faith in that sacrifice that God resurrected him from the dead and gave him a position in heaven where he's ruling over all nations and we're baptized, we come into contact with the benefits of his blood, receive the forgiveness of our sins. And we experience that great agape going from dead in our sins to being made alive together with Christ. If you want to become a saint, a child of God, uh, become baptized, experience that great agape, we can help you do that tonight. And also, if you need uh, prayers from the congregation or any anything that you would like to bring forth, uh, you can come to the front as we stand and sing.